This is a sedentary culture. It's also just ours, so we might not recognize what makes it unique compared to others, but being sedentary is sort of a hallmark of this culture. So what does that mean? It means that you don't see a tremendous amount of movement being modeled. So first question that I have for you, can you talk to us about our current state of sedentary behavior right now, what we're experiencing and why movement really matters? Uh, well, the, if I put the current state into one word, it would be unprecedented, mm. unprecedentedly high. Um, and why movement matters, and I think it would have to go back to that, modifying that first word is, we think of so much of movement as this whole body state, like, oh, I'm sitting in my chair, I'm, I'm not moving. But if folks have listened before, um, one of the big things that I try to teach people is like, yes, your whole body moves, but so do your individual parts. Each of those move. And then the cells of your parts, each of those move. And so we don't really have only a sedentary, not moving body problem. We have a not moving individual part and cells problem. And that transcends sort of where we think the consequences of not moving lie, which are on only the metabolic effects of the body. But now we're getting to the part by part genetics of the, the body. There's, a, there's many, many things that aren't moving. And so like, if you just think about your eyes, like we're not moving a lot, but our eyes aren't moving a lot. And that's mm. a part, maybe we sat around a lot before, but we didn't sit around a lot with our eyes not moving because they were focused on something. So it's just, it's a it's a much bigger issue than we think about. And, and we need movement. We need movement like we need good dietary nutrition. And so to be sort of in a movement drought unprecedentedly, I think is going to have a, some big consequences. Wow. That's a great term, movement drought. And movement drought. it's really even been exacerbated. You sent me a paper uh, a little while ago, maybe it was a month or two ago, but this had come out really early in this situation that we're all experiencing and highlighting how, you know, all the different mandates and things of that nature are exacerbating an already sedentary society. Things have just gotten worse. Well, right. Because I think that movement, if you read a lot of literature on the benefits of movement or physical activity is the term, um, it's really the relationship between movement and um, non-communicable diseases. And so you don't really see movement in communicable diseases before, but some of the literature now for people who are already really in public health, trying to highlight just the problem that we were facing with it inactivity two years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago, if you look at it, it just did a big exponential bump up because of really, um, you know, the protocols that were established for dealing with the, the global situation. And so it, like inactivity was already called a pandemic before. And so to see now the, the, inter, the interfacing of those two situations together for folks who are researching physical activity and really physical inactivity, it just the relevance is really sort of in our, in our faces right now, especially if you're in the movement world. So I'm loving your new book. It's totally just blowing my mind. And you really highlight that we have a dynamic category of needs that range from it's movement needs specifically from procuring food to family time to healthy movement to time in nature. These are all needs and you categorize those things. Now, we know that these things are good for us. We know that they're even essential, but it can often feel like it's a lot to manage. And I love your idea of stacking so can you talk about that first and foremost? Talk about stacking. Well, so I think people are familiar with multitasking, right? This idea of like, I'll get more done. I'll just do more things at once. So you got your list of things to do and you're trying to, you know, grocery shop and talk on the phone and talk to your kid at the same time. And that's the opposite of multitasking. That's trying to do three different tasks in the same period of time. I think spatially, so I think in terms of volume. So there's a volume of time and it has a certain amount of space within it and you're trying to cram a lot of to-dos in that period of time. Where stacking is the idea of looking at the tasks and trying to select one task that meets all of those needs. Because really, you know, research shows that people don't really multitask. What they're doing is 
switching between each one very quickly. You're always doing one thing at a time. So you're really, if you're doing, trying to do three things at once, you're doing, you're not doing two thirds of them all of that time. So everything's just sort of done poorly, you know, and, and you're pr particularly frazzled. So it's still work that goes into selecting tasks. Like how can I, I, I list all the need categories, right? Like we've got needs, we've got to, you know, we've got to work, kids got to go to school or be educated. Um, we all have to nourish our bodies. We all have to nourish our bodies with movement. So there's food needs and movement needs. There's needs to be with other people. There's community needs and um, there's needs for fun or play. There's needs for rest. So when you look at what your categories of needs are, if you look at your tasks, you'll find that sort of the way our society is worked out is to pull out time and try to spend 30 minutes on a particular need. Like I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to like work out for 30 minutes or 60 minutes, but you're usually doing that by yourself. And you're like, Oh, my kid needs some movement. All right. I, I got to go drive. I got to find a class. I got to drive him to a class. Now I got to put driving on there, which is nobody's need, but yet it has become the thing that facilitates many needs. So it's, um, this idea of going, how could I get the movement I need and the kid kids, um, get the movement they need. And, and we also need time together. Like, so it's trying to find a single task that facilitates multiple needs at the same time. So, oh yeah, I've, I've got, when, you, when I talk to you, I take notes. <laughs> you're, such, you're such a nerd. That's so great. <laughs> nerd alert. I just watched this movie. I think it's called Thunder Force. And it's a great, like, kind of funny superhero type movie with Melissa McCarthy. And there's a scene where her friend in the in the movie, she's very smart, right? And she gets a little bit bullied and somebody calls her a nerd. She's like, no, I'm smart. It's a difference. But for me, a nerd is a compliment. It's a compliment to me. I mean, I, it's just what I am. So bring it. <laughs> bring it. Bring it. <laughs> Pocket, pocket protector. So exactly. listen, I think that when you mentioned multitasking, was that as I was reading this in the book, it was the first thing that comes up. And you just mentioned something. We're not multitasking in reality. We're switching tasks. And when we do that, we are losing effectiveness and efficiency. There's a switching cost involved that we now we've got tons of research on this. And so with stacking, so you've already kind of outlined how stacking is different from multitasking. Can you give us an example of what stacking would look like? Well, so um, many parents and probably adults alike are struggling with like, how do I get my kids outside more? I, I need to get off my computer more. Um, we need to eat dinner, right? Like there's all these things, especially parents hold it in a to-do format. Kids maybe don't necessarily have it that way. But this idea of like, well, what if you just took your dinner and put it outside? Like, what if you just set it up on the patio or in the backyard? Mm -hmm. Or if you even wanted it to be not just family time, but that community time? What if you texted two of your friends, meet me at this park and everyone just bring their own food, but we're gonna eat together. The fact that you set up or chose to do dinner in that way is going to get you friend time that normally is associated with, you know, a, a party or a gathering where you got to clean your house and you got to stress out and make special food and the things that keep you from doing the activity that gives you the essence of what you need. You don't need to clean your house. You don't need to make special food. You need to hang out with your friends. And when you go out to hang out with your friends, they bring their kids and you bring your kids. And now, Hey, there's a group of, uh, peers of various ages, they're outside because that's where the dinner is. So they grab some food, but they're not going to sit down. They're all, everyone's off their screens now. And, oh, there's a playground right there, or there's a field, and someone brought a Frisbee, or someone brought a soccer ball. Now people are kicking it around. Very casual. Right. Very the way it, things used to happen. Very, you know, much less structured and uh, official and organized. But by making that one choice the stress of worrying about your kids sitting inside and not moving around enough and being too isolated and you needing some other adult contact or just casual hangout or three 
not having to mess up the house because you're eating in a park and it's so much easier to, to not disrupt your home space that you already cleaned three times that day. So that's what I mean. Like that was one task, okay. but it totally changes the outcome of that day. Um, and I don't have to drive anyone to class and I don't have to think, I don't have to think so hard besides the original thinking of figuring out what these tasks look like, which I tried to put a lot in the book. Like I'm trying to help you. Like here's a hundred tasks. <laughs> Be inspired, you know, adjust them to suit your unique situation. But but there are tasks out there because these are the original sort of human tasks. Right. That's the thing about it, too. So it's not multitasking. It's choosing one thing that meets these different needs. So we're meeting the community need, the food need, the outdoor slash nature need, all in one thing that you would just do. Right. You know, but what I think I really picked up from your book is it just is, it inspires more intentionality behind it. Like, why would I not do that? Like, let me, let's right. do that. Let's like, literally I thought about, let's have dinner tonight outside on our little outdoor table, which we've used like once yeah. ever. And it's just sitting there. So yeah, already, you know what? I think that if we could, I want to give another example because earlier when you mentioned driving and you gave for people who can't see the video, you gave a, a dirty face. You just gave it the you gave it a side eye. <laughs> I spit exactly. upon your shoes driving. And I think, you know, even for if something is literally, you know, we'll just say 15 minute walk away, we're going to jump in the car. Let's just be honest. Most folks are just going to jump in the car, run and pick up whatever it is and come back. Whereas, you know, if we think about it in this in this context of stacking, we can change that. And also I thought about how, and this is true, like I think a lot of us automatically do this, even when we do need to drive somewhere, we'll say, you know, maybe it's a 30 minute drive to the store or whatever. We also make sure we get the closest parking space possible. Heaven forbid yeah. we should have to walk, you know, two minutes outside to get to the door, you know? So we're walking as little as possible and have supplanted that activity so much for other means like driving, for example. So what's another use of stacking here? Uh, well, one that, one that really got me through the years of my young, with having young kids and having long days with young kids, and now is sort of a really dear to me practice with older kids who are 10, you know, and eight, um, is choosing to walk that 15 minutes. Like, not just, you know, if we need to go to the store, this idea of, do you want to take a walk with mom to the store? No. Okay. Come on, come with me. We're going to go, we're going to go make something special and I'll let you pick out some ingredients or something. So you're, it's this together time. Yeah. Um, I think that talking to kids sometimes can be challenging, especially when you're like, let's sit down and talk. And every kid just like sort of horrified, like, why would we do that? You know, like that's such <laughs> an adult sort of thing to do. But, but when kids are together in groups or even when they're with us, once you're walking and sort of doing something else, all these things start bubbling up. This thing is happening because they're not sitting face to face. It's not sort of a pressure to talk. You're in sort of a movement meditation. You've, you've freed up the occupation of your body step after step and you just go get the thing for, for cooking. And, and I would further stack it by saying, you know, the challenge. And when kids are younger, this is all like below teenager, I would say they're really keen to do different things and be in charge of stuff. So it's like, if you were going to make dinner, what would you make? And it's like, right, let's let, like, right. Like, and the, yeah. let's go get the ingredients and no criticism, whatever you want, let's go make it, you know? And, and now the walk, you're walking, planning, like, how are you going to make that? Like, what tools are you going to use? And, and now it becomes a planning session. It becomes now I would put that under education because why do we send our kids to be educated, to learn how to fend for themselves, take care of their fundamental needs. I got to walk. Um, you know what I mean? Like I got the exercise of walking to and from, and we got the extra carrying because we're carrying the stuff home, um, that we're going to use. And so that would be another simple task. And even when we are in places where a walk all the way to the store might not be feasible. Walk part way. You know, this idea that <clears throat> if I can't do the entire thing, I can do none of it. That is such a debilitating mindset to get into. It's like, we're going to go and we'll park down here and we'll just walk even the half a mile up. Or maybe your kids need to start with something shorter. That's fine. Like just pick something and sort of make a ceremony or celebration around it because you did that, you did that thing. And that's really great. And then they'll know they can do it. And then eventually they'll go farther. 
Yeah, I love this so much. I'm a big, and I think it, we've got to pay attention to our own personality as well. I'm a I'm much more task oriented person, mm -hmm. and so for my son, what I would do. So this one, my oldest son was maybe you know nine years old. Um, if we wanted to watch a movie, this is back before Netflix was dominating the world, and you don't have to go anywhere. So we had blockbuster video, family video. And so if we wanted to rent a movie, I'm like, oh, well, we're going to definitely ride the bike to go get it. And it's a nice mm -hmm. little, it's a couple miles away, you know. And so the first time we went, it was tough. Like, it seemed like we would never get there. But then it just got easy. Like, even the second time, even on the way back, it seemed so much shorter, you know. So we had a task-oriented thing. It was just like, okay, we want to get a movie. Let's go, you know, we'll ride the bike. So we've got this task-oriented thing. We're going to get this entertainment. we got time together. We've got this physical exertion. And we've got nature time as well like we stacked that thing and i was it was for a reason for me mentally gives me my little brain candy and that just became our thing you know nine times out of ten that what we do that was what we would do and it became at at a point pretty easy for us to do that and so it's just kind of but also it's integrating into the culture and so this gets in the conversation that you really bring forth in the book which is all these different containers of our reality that really dictate and guide our movements and you talk about how culture is a powerful container for our movement. So how is that? What, what does that mean? Well, it's so easy to think of, you know, put a shoe on your foot and that's a container for your foot, right? Because your foot can't move as well when it's in a shoe versus out of a shoe. But culture is a little bit more challenging to imagine because some a lot of it's invisible, but it is. I, I organize the, the containers by size meaning the amount of time you're spending in them. And you're in your culture pretty much 100% of your life. And so this is a sedentary culture. It's also just ours, so we might not recognize what makes it unique compared to others, but being sedentary is sort of a hallmark of this culture. So what does that mean? It means that you don't see a tremendous amount of movement being modeled. Um, if everyone else is sedentary around you, then to sort of fall in line with your culture. And when you think of bi culture, I think of biology, this idea that you've duplicated cells that are the same in a container, like right? you've, you've cultured something. So that's, the, that's what makes it it's similar. And, and that's how cells are sort of converted into the behavior of the, the broader culture. Mammals learn through mimicking much more than through written words or symbols. And so you're already, this is how you, this is how you use furniture. Houses are what you live in. This particular style houses, all of their houses are weird. All of their houses that don't have furniture looks like that. That's weird because, because you're sort of organized to what you see the adults or the peers grow up to be. Um, and then also a lack of permission to move signs that actually discourage movement that we might not even really see beyond the perception of, Oh, th this is the rules for the safety of being in this area. But there's a tremendous number of signs up that, that really say movement is not for here. Right. And so my question is then, I would like you then to write out where movement is allowed. If it's not allowed inside the house and, and, um, this park is only for age, these particular ages mm -hmm. and, and you can't skateboard here or bring your bike or the other act physical activity to this school campus when the school is closed, even though this is where we would say children are allowed to move and, and you can only move during these periods of time. What you start to see is, we have sort of eradicated where movement is okay as a culture while also simultaneously telling everyone they need to move more. Hmm. And, that, and that you're a bad parent if your kids aren't moving more. It's like, where would you like them to move? Because when I go into a space, like keep your kids quiet, make sure they're sitting so they don't disturb everyone else. And it's like, when you, when you actually take an objective look at it and write it down, you're gonna see that the reason we have this ever increasing inactivity is because as a culture, we keep removing permission for it. We keep saying that you're not part of the culture, sort of, if you're 
moving in this way, especially for children, you, you can move in a fitness way. You can move in classes, yeah. you can move in gyms, you can move when you're in the appropriate mm -hmm. box for it. Right. But, but that's a very small period of time. And for many people, it's not even accessible. Like, so, so like, that's, that's my greater point is it's time to look at the, the cultural, the sedentary culture effect on the other citizens of, of this culture, especially the young ones. You know what, when you said that, like literally you brought something to the foreground that we all see and that I see, but I never really thought about it. And how I see the signs, like I go for a walk on the playground and it's like no jumping, no skateboarding here, you know, no running, no this, no that. It's, tell, it's all of this dictation on what you can't do. And especially again at appropriate times. And by the way, this place is fenced off. You can't use it at any other time except during the recess time. And so I think this is something else that you talk about in the book, which is the fact that our culture now that we're existing in here in the United States specifically, and also of course around the world as well, it's, it's a big issue, but our culture is made not moving so easy. Yeah. And that's something else that you talk about. And so. I love this idea. So number one, you bring this to our awareness, but also you say, hey, it's okay because we do have these safety metrics. Sometimes it's appropriate. However, let's put up some signs and say, hey, jump here. This is a good place for you to jump. Yeah. This is a good place for you to run. And in that context, I also thought about, you know, like literally um, get tag has been banned at certain schools. Like you can't play tag. A kid got hurt before. And this is the thing. And that's, of course, like we don't want that to happen. That's that's terrible. We never want a child to get hurt. However, if you're not taking calculated risk in life, that in and of, of itself is making you a tremendous risk. You're not going to be adaptable when inevitable things happen in life. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I do think, I mean, I understand, I, I don't, I understand this purpose of the signs. Like we understand that we don't want property to be, property to be destroyed and children to get hurt. But again, it comes back to if you've removed large areas of movement for the safety of children or property, where do you expect this movement to happen? I want you to go beyond the rule of where you can't move and be follow that through. If it's a need and you took it away here, where does it go on the other side? What formats look okay to you? Do that work to actually round out the solution because the child still needed movement. So if due to our way of setting up a culture for the legalities of that culture, you know, in case someone gets hurt, I don't want you hurt on my property, but we have other citizens who have needs in this particular way, then, then what does it look like for everyone to still get that basic need to be met and, and, and then city planners or smaller communities, um, can make adjustments. Or like I said, you know, I, I made home in an environment because in many cases, those concerned about their children getting more movement, movement isn't even allowed in their own home, meaning that right. the parents themselves haven't really looked hard. I mean, it's easy to sort of say, you know, my kid can't move anywhere. And then it's like, you know, stop jumping on the couch because everybody knows you shouldn't jump in your house, but I think you should be able to jump there. And someone else is like, well, I don't think so. So then you have to sort of, you know, start with your own home. Then look at, you know, there's a bias check-in in every cult in every chapter to say, I want you to answer these 10 or 15 questions, because by doing so you're going to tune into really your own belief system and understanding and, and these um, rules that you might have that you right. might might not even realize relate to movement. Right. Oh, that's so powerful. And I'm so, I love the timing of this because this is over the last year because of the, all the time for self-reflection and self-analysis, I've been catching myself in that thought process of seeing my son running and jumping onto the couch. And I would literally think, I think I even told him one time, I was like, if I did that, my mom would kick me in the in my sternum, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, but I, what I've done is I've become aware of that and just like, is he really hurting something, number yeah. one? Number right. two, encouraging that. Because the thing is, he's doing a behavior that he's seen me seen me do, but it's just in this kind of appropriate time. Like I'm all, I'm kind of like analyzing like, where is this okay? Because I push the boundaries of that. So for example, 
and we'll put a video up for folks uh, of this. Like we were on a tram at the airport one day and I didn't even think about it. I just kind of tend to see the world through a lens of play. And there's these like these um, uh, things hanging down for people to hold on to. I just grabbed them and started doing pull-ups. There's, you know, some people up in the front of the car, they're kind of probably looking back, probably impressed. But, you know, maybe some of them like, what is this guy doing? That's not appropriate. We have those social conditionings where we are afraid to do stuff like that. But I, did, I literally didn't think anything about it. And I think my wife maybe pulled the phone out and started recording. I was just enjoying the process because it just felt cool. It was fun. The train is moving. So it's like a different feeling. And so yesterday, and this is what I wanted to tell you, my, my kids were getting new mattresses. And so temporarily the mattress was at the bottom of a staircase. And I come down and my son's like, my youngest son's nine. He's like, dad, come here. I want to show you something. And I'm just like, what is it? I didn't know this mattress was right there. And I come and I see him and he immediately jumps off the stairs and dives onto this mattress. And I'm just like, whoa, good job, buddy. You know, it's just, and it's just like six stairs, it's not a big deal. But he found, he found a, a way to play, he found a new creation in the house. And I could have been like, hey, don't do that. That's, that's not safe. And I could see the part of me that wants to do that. And it's just like, let's create a, a this is what I want to ask you specifically. We know the overarching culture is geared towards making sedentary behavior the norm. Can we create our own cultures? How can we go about creating our own cultures in our own little bubble that can encourage more movement? Absolutely. I mean, there is no one culture because really we each have multiple cultures within ourselves. You belong to many and they are at different scales, but your home culture is your home culture. And you have a lot of control over your home culture. It just is a lot of work, like you said, to to check in with like, what exactly am I worried about? How, what would the consequences be? What's the consequences of them not doing it? You know, you, it's really, you have to do such a, a much broader risk benefit uh, analysis than we're used to. Like we're just sort good, bad, done, you know? And it's like, well, what exactly, like you need, you need to have a, you need to have, I call it a personal mission statement. You know, people have mission statements for their business, but they have no personal mission statement and they have no family mission statement that takes into consideration the unique direction of every single person within the family. So your family culture, that was in a different book that I wrote, was like, you should make one, even if it's just keywords, because then you could see quickly, does me squelching this behavior align with my mission statement or not? No, I want, you know, I want him to be my son in this case, to be robust physically. I want him to have some autonomy over making decisions. I want to reinforce it. He knows his body. Um, there's, there's nothing that could be damaged. Um, if there was, I could talk to him specifically about that particular damage and say, Hey, could you make sure that this doesn't happen and then go on, you know, let him know what your needs are. You know, it's just, again, that same old how to be with people. And yes, you, when you do that with your own family members or even a larger culture that's outside of your family, any other group that you belong to, maybe it's a sports team. Maybe it's the sports team where you're like, Hey, we're trying to change our personal food culture. Is there a way we could not do, you know, sodas at this event because it's becoming, you know, a chat, like, could we do this? You know, like, it's just the difficulty of broaching communication with someone else is really the barrier to making a lot of these changes. And then just when you have been honest and written down what you need and why, and you feel comfortable bringing it to other people who love you in your community, that's, you know, that's, that's when change happens versus rules. Don't do this, this not allowed. Mm. I'm like, you know, if we could just have communications human to human, people are much more willing to adjust their behavior than putting down a bunch of mandates. Oh, oh you just said the M word. All right. Well, let's go to a different M word, which is a, a term that I picked up from you. And this isn't bad, guys. It's not a, this is not profanity, but it's mechanical nutrients. So when we're talking about the the need for these things let's talk a little bit more about why so what first of all what are mechanical nutrients mechanical nutrients are what happens when your when your body moves so when your body moves the cells of the parts that are moving become squished or change shape 
And when those cells are squished or change shape, the parts of the cell that monitor the cell's position create a biochemistry. So that's called mechanotransduction. And so it's very similar to dietary nutrients. You put food in your body and your body takes the chemical compounds and that becomes chemical signals. And those that bio or it, it becomes biochemistry essentially. We don't think of movement as going into our body, but movement coming into our body eventually becomes biochemistry mm, by the right. act of bending or squishing the cells. And so my argument is always been to recognize the essentialness of movement by classifying it as a nutrient because it meets the same conditions and, and dietary compounds aren't the only compounds. Like we've said that sunlight has a nutrient in it. So we're already okay with non foods being classified as nutrients. Nutrients are something that in their absence, there are a predictable set of symptoms that arise and that when you reintroduce the compound, those symptoms go away. So if you've ever wondered why we have things called vitamins, it's because someone figured out that, Hey, when this compound X, we don't know what it is, but we had a group and we tested over hundreds of years and we've been able to figure out that, Hey, and there is a compound, some essential thing when you eat. And if, if a group didn't get it, they would have these predictable symptoms. And we figured out what the food is by adding it back in. And those symptoms went away. So movement is already operating in that framework. We just don't use those words. We've chosen a whole different set of words. And so it makes it very hard to see why movement is essential and works in the same way as dietary nutrition. So if you got a sore shoulder or elbow or whatever, you know, your physiotherapist isn't going to say you should walk more. They're not going to give you a general movement prescription. They're going to say, no, you need to hold your elbow at this degrees and move this. Like you're going to toggle this very narrow switch because we need those cells to feel this movement so that they adapt. So it's different than you want to be healthier, eat more in hopes that you get more nutrients. It's like, no, we know, we know we've figured out the exact dosage here that you need. Um, we just don't call it vitamin a bicep curl with your arm turned five degrees. So, so for every movement, there's a different squish and each one of those is a different nutrition, so to speak. Um, and so we haven't figured out what the full doses of, um, movement are beyond the general physical activity of like, Hey, you need to move total. You should have some strength, some cardio, some flexibility. Oh, it turns out, okay, you also need to move your hips in these certain ranges of motion. Like we're getting, we're going from macronutrients to micronutrients right now. It's going to take some time, but that's it. It's this idea that there's stuff your body needs that is happening in the cellular squishes when you move your body in lots of different ways. <sighs> Katie, why do you do this? You blew my mind over here. <laughs> like I'm still trying to gather, put my mind back into my body or wherever the mind exists. Listen. You just, I just had this huge revelation right now because we usually think about ATP, for example, in the construct of this nutritional pathway, but movement can trigger the creation or the, generate the response of ATP being created in the body as well. And so literally this is a, an issue with semantics because when you're talking about mechanical nutrients, that really is like, it's the same outcome that we're looking for with food is the creation of a certain uh, chemical output and the body is doing the same thing when you move and so I'm, I'm just I'm trying to revel I'm trying to bask <laughs> in the glow of this insight is so powerful so powerful um, I think also if you could if that if this is the case right so we have essential movement nutrients that we require right now we're also experiencing then a parallel of a tremendous amount of movement hunger so can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Well, I said a movement drought um, before, but I think hunger is probably a better framework because we all, we're an eating culture and we have trained, we've been trained by our adults and we've trained our children to recognize the signals that come from their body in terms of food. So it's like, I feel this or that. It's like, 
That's just hunger. My stomach hurts. Oh, you're hungry. That's what it, that's what it does. Um, your kids eat too much sugar. They have a particular behavior. You know, you correlate like you ate. So like your, your activity level or your vibrations is, is based on this thing that you've consumed this way. Like we just, we give our children this eating framework, but very rarely will we say, oh, you're feeling this way because you're under moved. You know, we, we don't use that terminology. Um, we, we call it something else. And I think it's because we don't have movement at our fingertips to help each other, to help our children learn what the symptoms of movement hunger look like. So if someone feels like, I know for me, and maybe other spouses do, you know, my husband will be like, you need to take a walk. And I'm like, and, he, and what he means is, the feelings that you're having right now that you perceive are about some other things are your symptoms of inactivity. Mm -hmm. I go on a walk. Guess what? Doesn't bug me anymore. Situation mm -hmm. change. You could you could frame it in a lot of different ways, but the fact of the matter is, my um, buildup of emotions is de is definitely related to how much I've metabolized my biochemistry overall. So I've really made a point to frame a lot of my children's experiences of. Well, you've been sitting down for a long period of time. Like what would jumping up, like what if you jumped off the banister, you know, this many times? Okay, I feel better now. Great. You know, or, you know, uh, if they're sitting in a position for a long time, like my back hurts, my, I'm getting this pain thing. I'm like, well, what's your back been doing for the last 60 minutes? Go do something else from your back and, and, and learn that that signal is your body communicating with you about something and move and put some different calories in there, you know, and you tell your kids, go have a snack when they're hungry, go drink a glass of water, you know? And so it's just using that language a little bit more in the end helps children understand that, oh, movement is this thing that if I do it or not, it's affecting my outcome. And now I have a much bigger toolbox for dealing with my, um, my experience. Yeah. And this is the thing too. And I love, this is a big reason that I admire and love your work so much is it, it's really just, it's data driven and you just make it make sense for folks. We have mountains and mountains of peer reviewed evidence on the benefits of walking in the context of so many different health issues, including massive amounts on mental health issues, for example. Yeah. But we have this sedentary culture where that's not prescribed for you to go for a 20 minute walk to deal with the anxiety or the depression or whatever the case might be, the, the, the stress. When in fact, if you look at the data, it's oftentimes more effective than this pill, for example. Everything has its place, but we've just really been inundated in, in our culture with jumping right to this thing to treat a symptom when we're really deficient on movement, for example. And also I think that we're, if we're using the same framework, we're overeating certain movement behaviors. We're overeating chair sitting, for example. Right. And can you talk about that? Because basically we, our body with that kind of um, signal trans, uh, mechano transduction that you mentioned, and just essentially, I think we're becoming really well shaped for sitting on the couch. Well, and that's what I try to point out. I said the best exercise program many people are per participating in is sitting. And I, I say that because I think that we believe that we're, our bodies are only adapting to the behaviors that we do when we're trying to improve our health, but your body is just adapting period. And, and your body is just always going, what are you doing? How can I make this easier on you? Like that's really the really basic sort of primal response. And so, you know, if, if you were an athlete you know, or like if, if you've ever tried to become a jogger or a runner, you know, you struggle at the beginning because as you, as you acquire that skill, your body is like, oh, are you going to do, are you going to do this one time? All right, no big deal. Oh, you do this two days. All right. Oh, you've been doing this for three days. All right. I got to make this a little easier on me. I'm going to add some capillaries. I'm going to go ahead and beef these cells up because I noticed you were putting load on here. And so it, it's changing its anatomy. Your body is changing its anatomy in order to make the thing that you're doing easier on you. Sitting is the same way. Oh, you're going to sit here today? Okay. I'm going to, oh, you're going to still sit here? Okay. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to maintain these capillaries that are unused. That's a waste of your energy. I'm going to get rid of those. I'm actually going to let your capillary volume go down. You don't need all this extra blood shunting stuff if you're just going to sit here. 
you don't need all of those minerals in your bones. If you're not going to be putting your weight on your hips, we'll remove those too to make this thing that you're doing easier on you. So you, the exercise adaptation is not really an adaptation to exercise. It's an adaptation to load. You're loading a hundred percent all of the time. And so when you can think about it, instead of sort of like, I'm moving, I'm not moving, and think about it instead of I'm always moving, what exercise program am I doing right now? It makes it a lot easier to be like, I don't want hips at 90 degrees. I'm going to, I'm going to stand up a few times a day. Cause I want to break, I want to shake up that exercise program a little bit. It doesn't mean you have to run eight hours a day, but just changing up the geometry of your resting position mix is like cross training. It's, it is a cross training for sure. Mm, oh my goodness. I love this so much. So good. So now, okay. The majority, the vast majority of our movement behavior today being sitting, chair sitting, couch sitting is happening indoors, obviously. Yeah. And you know, what's so crazy now, even as I'm saying this, after reading your book, when I'm saying indoors and outdoors, it's a little bit of this dichotomy that's kind of superficial because it's like nature's outside and we're, we're distinctly <laughs> different from nature. So can you talk about, because you really bring this forward in the book that nature is really considered an essential input. It really is an essential input. And we have a massive nature deficiency right now. So talk about that. And also the fact that why humans, we have this tendency to separate ourselves from being a part of nature. Oh my gosh, those are such, how, how long is this show? These are like really deep things. But, we gotta um, go deep, <laughs> I know, I know we do. Okay, so, so nature, I'm gonna put air quotes around nature for those listening. Nature in, in this way is really this like understanding of green spaces. Like what, is, what do we get when we go outside? There's natural light. There's, there's light that changes throughout the day. There's temperature variance. There is sounds that we don't hear. There's a distance that our eyes can see and therefore different muscles in our eyes are allowed to work differently. There's the bio, uh, chemistry that's coming off of the trees that you interact with. There's a whole different microbiome out there. Um, there's uh, lumps and bumps and, and shapes of sitting down. And so it's a, a much more dynamic, diverse environment that stimulates the body when they're out there. It's such a nebulous concept that at this point, it's really just the understanding of humans need that, <laughs> you know, like they're, they're, do, they're doing such work to try to break down what it is exactly. And that sort of relates to why do humans see themselves as outside of everything? And so I, I don't get too much into this in the book, but it's just, we, I think it's the way that at this point humans, like it's like as our way of understanding the world changed from the experiential to the written reduced knowledge, trying to figure out the details. You keep separating the detail from the thing. Like you want to pull it out and you want to look at it, you want to pull it out and you want to look. So even right now we need nature. The solution is right. We should all go into nature. The solution is let's figure out what it is in nature that we need so that we can get it while we're inside. Right. right? So, 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 uh, so I think it's just perhaps the very, um, natural consequence of being tinkers, like humans are tinkerers. Like that's how we got to where we are right now. So you have to sort of give thanks for what got us to this point, which doesn't mean you can't reflect and choose the direction you want to go. Right. So, so our ancestors tinkered and tinkered away, figuring out ways to make it easier, which means ways to make more of us. And, and so like, that's just, it might just be the humans way in the world. Um, it's just how we've spread out and, and, and our solutions, we, at this point, like, I think culture and biology are very um, intrinsically bound where culture over a longer period of time ends up becoming part of your biology 
for the next group, you know? So it, it's still mutable, although the scale is much longer than we could probably really perceive in terms of um, human generations. But anyway, so I, I think that we have that tendency. We have that tendency to see ourselves as like, nature is out there and we're in here. And I'm like, nature is everything. Like, and also like keeping thinking that we're separate from nature is sort of the problem. The fact that I can, I don't need, I don't need movement because I can just figure out a way to not need movement. We haven't been able to tinker that far, but it's definitely, I think it's probably on someone's to-do list. You know, like someone's working on that problem right now is how do I figure out some sort of machine to stand on, to vibrate me? If like, like if, I did, if I did do something for 36 minutes, could I get all the, you know, movement needs of my entire body? You know, like this idea of reducing it down Right. Um, oh, right. So true. All you need is five minutes on this thing and it, it equals out shorter. two hours. Right. It keeps getting shorter. <laughs> it used to be like 12 minute abs and then it was like eight minute abs. And then of course, you know, now it's two minute abs and, yep. and it just keeps, it just keeps decreasing. But instant abs. That's the next one. <laughs> it's, just, it's just abs. It's just like abs, you know, get up. Get up. <laughs> Can you talk about, because you made a great analogy that really opened, th that's why even when I mentioned these, this discernment, for me, it sounds a little bit silly now, is because you gave the example of beavers. Like beavers build stuff. So can you talk about that? Yeah. So I was like, we're just, I mean, humans take stuff in nature and build it into something that wasn't there before. We do that too. We're, it's just the scale upon which we're doing it is extremely accelerated. And, 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 we're not, and the reason I use that is because everything that we're using is still just something that was on earth that was dug up, broke down, smashed together with some heat or some other chemicals. Like we're still all working with stuff that's here on the planet. Right. So in that way, we're doing this natural behavior. It's just that the, the rate of destruction is really high and it's because it's fast and there's a lot of people doing it. And also what I would say is like a beaver takes a stick and builds a, a dam or a, a house out of it. And the, what do I want to say? The, the byproduct of that house is almost negligible meaning there's no extra materials mm. created where, mm. so if I took a, you know, if I was going to do a, a piece of traditional footwear that's been around for thousands of years, like a moccasin, what am I doing? I killed a deer. I'm using the scraps from my meal to make a shoe. Those shoes are going to be around. I'll wear them off. They're going to fall down and they go back to the earth very quickly. So my footprint, if you will, is extremely small. But as we, as we push for materials that didn't exist before, still using earth stuffs to make them, the waste that is not the shoe is really high. So I can make a shoe, but the amount of non-shoe stuff that was made that's not the shoe, like that relationship between the two is much different. So it's all just, it's all just increased, even though the, the foundational element of humanity is the same. But the access to the materials and the rate and the scale upon which we build is so much bigger. And the amount of time, the things that we're building with, that they stay doing nothing, like that's like trash. And it just, the scale, the scale is much different. The scale is really the only thing that's different to me. Yeah, so true. Like I could, I thought about it, like the, the beaver doesn't have like fumes coming out of this beaver house right. and, you know. Ah, so good. Um, this still, I, I want to dig into this just a little bit more because when I was early in my career, even, you know, like I just didn't see the value in walking, even though it's the most natural, normal thing that we're designed to do. If somebody's just like, you know, they're walking to, you know, lose weight or be healthy, whatever. I'm just like, in my mind, I'm like, you need, you're going to have to hurry up. You're going to need to <laughs> speed that walk up. Um, but in reality, it is such a nutrient dense movement, if we could frame it like that. So can you talk about why walking is such a nutrient dense movement and also why you shifted from telling people to walk more? Oh, well, for exactly that reason. You're like, why would I walk? It's so slow. I got all these tasks to do. I, I, I got like, it's gonna take too long. I could, I could do so much more 
if I just drove or I could fit my workout in more if I just ran. I could do the same distance in half half the time. So so I, I've stopped telling people just to walk more, period. Instead, I'll try to approach like, you can actually get more done in many cases if you choose to walk. Because walking, well, let's go with first like why it's a nutrient dense movement, it really uses a lot of your body. It, it loads the bones, right? So like if you were to compare it cycling, for example, walking, you are weight bearing on your body. Where cycling, you're not. Your weight is really put upon your seat, which is put upon the frame, right? So it's you carrying your weight around, a good thing to do. So we talk about body weight exercise, walking is a body weight exercise. It's where your limbs get to feel how much you move. They're also moving through a really big range of motion. Um, you know, your arms are swinging front to back, much different than the computer position or even your arms affixed to a bicycle position, right? Where your arms are still sort of in the computer position. So you get the shoulder movement, your legs are getting behind you perhaps for the first time that day. Like even if you're cycling, your thigh bone never goes behind you. Yes, it's moving a lot, but it's not, it's moving through a very narrow range of its potential. So walking again, it just, it, it moves a lot of body parts. And when you carry something too, at the same time, there's a lot of core work, coordination, glute work that goes into walking. I mean, as simple as it is and as slow and boring as it can seem, your body doesn't feel that way. Your, your mind feels that way, but your body doesn't necessarily feel that way. Um, especially if, if you can figure out like if walking hurts and there's a different ranges of ability, but if walking is bugging you in your knees or your hips or your feet, you want to sort that out because for this other reason, why I recommend walking, walking really facilitates lots of experiences and transportation like getting from point a to point b is a thing that humans do like moving around and it's a really it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to to explain it now because we've become so car centric recently that unless you are a walker which i am a walker meaning i choose that as transportation you don't really realize that we've given up most of the walkways for carways. I mean, I've been walking and hanging off the side of a freeway before because there's no other way to get to a place anymore without a car, mm. without a motorized transportation. And so it's just um, one, one of the reasons that people don't move, it has a lot to do with their economical reasons because time and economical reasons really go hand in hand. This exercise move more requires oftentimes that you have free time. And so what they really understand is a lot of people don't have free time. And so if you use an economical model, which is, it's called sloth. Have you ever heard of it? So it's, it says that all that humans are really, and, and it's an American model, I believe you're spending your time sleeping, leisure, occupation, travel, and home that those are, that, that's the times that you're in and they all relate sort of to the economy of your time, but also that's relating to the overall economy of how much you're having to work, you know, to survive really, you know, financially. So transportation is one of those places that it's very easy to add movement to getting to some other place where you need to do a task. So walking and, and even cycling, if, if you can't walk or other forms of rolling, allow you to add more movement into the transportation time, which because everything is sort of parsed and separated now, we spend a lot of time getting to a place to do a thing, right? Like how much of your time is not doing a thing, but getting to a place to do the thing. Like economically, it's a huge wasted period of time. We try to fill it with podcasts, you know, to better yourself for learning. Thanks everyone for listening. And then, you know, you try to fill it, maybe some reading, maybe some talking, maybe some relaxing, but movement can go in there too. So this idea that active transport is a way that 
can really be a viable solution and walking to be such a whole body one um, requires no gear, um, has pretty low carbon footprint. It's got actual footprints, you know, that's why I'm in favor of it. I'm not going to tell you to do it, but I am going to tell you all of the benefits that come from doing it and where it can fit in. Uh, oh, so good. So good. So in the book, you really outline these various containers that influence slash encourage orchestrate or even inhibit our various movements right and so we we mentioned already the culture container but another one of them that spoke especially to my heart was the food slash cooking container so can you talk about that one a little bit and why you decided to put, I mean, of course it's like in, integrated into it in the first place, but why did you make it an emphasis to talk about in the book? Look at how much time we spend dealing with food. I mean, if we go back to the most primal state, the only reason we get up and move around each day is to eat. Like that's it. When you, when you come down to actually things that matter, it's, it's your food and water. Like, and air, you know, like those are the top things and they have become the bottom set of knowledge that we hold. Like it has become the bottom thing in terms of understanding how it works. And it is still the top thing for humans. Meaning, meaning these, this, this is this, this is the framework you will die without you like when we don't know where food comes from and it doesn't come from a store, like when you, when you lose that cultural awareness of where food comes from and how to procure it yourself in the way that every human really leading up to us did until this outlying time. Um, I felt it was important to call it out that way. And then also, even if your food knowledge is really low, you still eat all the time. You eat every day, you know, multiple times a day, often. It takes up so much of our daily experience. So it's actually a quite a large container. It's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the uh, culture food, uh, sorry, culture apparel food. It's the third biggest container. Cause I was like, you're probably going to get dressed before you eat. I mean, uh, you do. Unless, do. unless yeah, you're exactly. into that kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like no judgment. Um, so yeah, so it's, um, it's also, and I said this in Move Your DNA, getting up to eat why, was why humans moved in the first place. Meaning hunger is the signal, movement is how that hunger signal is closed. I mean, you eventually have to put food in, but, but food is not coming to you, buddy. You know, like you're going to have to get up and go for it. You have to go find it. You have to source it. You have to know what's edible, what's not edible. Like this is the original human knowledge. And, and frankly, many people still hold this knowledge. They're just making the food for all of us so that we don't have to hold knowledge for it. We could just, you know, go eat dinner outside on the patio and it's awesome. But it's also, um, it is the thing that moves us the most. So if you're going, I don't know how to move more with my kids or my family, I might consider teaching them about food, not just feeding them, but restore, restore that food knowledge. And you can choose the scale upon which you want to do it. If it's just, here's how to hold a knife and here's how to chop something. That's great. If, if you want to just make the movement, put all these things in a pot and cook it yourself. That's great. If you want to plant some sunflower seeds in your window right now, so they can see a seed and the fact that it plus soil and the air can pull mass and grow into something that didn't exist before do that and look at like, that's a task. Like you want to talk about miracles. You want to talk about the miracle of life and why we get to be here, plant a sunflower seed in the window. And guess what? The movement to go find a box, to go get the seeds, to bring it water every day, those are movements too. We've been told that we need exercise. We don't need exercise. The only reason exercise is even on the table as a word, as a concept, is because we let all the food and movement go and we're trying to like 
bring it into the house. Like we're trying to be like, oh, let's go get some of that nature and bring it into the house. Let's make a movement house. You know, right. we can <laughs> from our house house to the movement house and we never have to go outside. So it's just that it was just, and it, it's like solution. Like you could read it at that level. I know you get it at that level. Thank you for asking me about it at mm-hmm. that level. But it could also be if you take cream and you shake it in a jar, you're going to have butter. And you know what makes it butter? Movement. It cells mm. banging up against each other make butter. And your arm muscles making that movement make butter. And people have been doing that for thousands of years. And now you are part of it. You're back in line with this chain. Like you're, you're, you're getting back in line with this thread. And to me, I love humans. I love all the humans, like, I, I, I want to, like, that's just my way of going. You were wondering what maybe you could do with your kid that would inspire them to want to be in the world a little bit. Show them some magic. So show, show them some old magic. Mm, right. Original magic. This is pre David Blaine, David Copperfield magic right here. Pre Houdini. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what? I, I really want everybody to get this because, again, you just did it again. You blew my mind. The number one driver through our evolution as humans, the number one driver of movement is to procure food. That's the number one thing encouraging and inspiring us to move was to get food. That's why we did it. 20,000 years ago, a hunter-gatherer wasn't coming out of his, you know, his tent or whatever the case might be, uh, his, his, uh, his teepee. And he's just like telling the guys, like, I'm about to go for my run. They're going to be like, why? What do you mean? You know, it, I'm, I'm going to go and procure food. That's the whole purpose. And now today, that piece, the, the number one driving force of human movement has been taken away. You know, the, the most you got to go is just walk into your kitchen. But even that, though, we can add dimensions of movement to, which I love that you're talking about on that kind of very granular level. But from a bigger perspective for us to wake up and see that that has been removed from our culture where we even have to be involved in our food in the first place. So taking a step of let's get more involved in what we're doing in the kitchen and cooking and encouraging that with our kids, growing things, go, even an action step going to a farmer's market, for example, uh, versus, you know, now, now you don't even have to go to the grocery store. You can door dash it. You could do whatever. We're just taking more and more steps out of the process of moving. Next, we're going to just have chairs that feed us, you know, (laughs) but you can go to a farmer's market. You can engage with the farmer. I've been invited to go to their farms and things like that. You know, you can get closer and closer and closer to your food. You know, there are folks who are still gathering things. They're still foraging. They're still hunting, you know, but, and they have a different level of association and activity involved. And there's like an honor that they experience. It's like something very primal, you know, we tap into. So, yeah, it's a very different world. And one of the other terms that you use in the book was snacktivities snack as well. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Let's get snacktive. Well, yeah, I mean, that's food moves are snacktivities. It's choosing a task that meets multiple needs at once. You're making your, you're meeting your food need, you're meeting a movement need, and then you're also often meeting a learning need. And then if you're doing it together, you're meeting that family time need. Um, and then if you're doing it outside, you can add a nature need at the same time. So, so a snack activity is a whole list of tasks that you can do. Um, so for example, like right now, dandelions are everywhere. So going out to forage dandelions, if you know what those are, um, from an area that's not spread. There's so many things that kids can do and then you can cook with them and they're not only a nutrient-dense wild food, it's also plant understanding. It's just, again, learning something about your environment, recognizing an edible food. So that's just an example of a snack activity. They're just tasks that blend food or eating with something else besides eating like any, anything else, but it's usually movement. That's the active part. And then you can layer it on. If you bring friends, like we throw lots of snack activity parties where, you know, I know that not everyone wants to do all the work or can do all the work to, you know, get cream and jars and shake it up. So I'll have, you know, all the kids come over after school. I'm like, this is what you're going to make today. You guys are making the butter. Here you go. And they are 
spending time outside and it's not even about the movement to shake the jar. It's about the fact that they get that free play, that free group play. We're not in school. It's not a recess time. There's no rules about this particular game. It's just a freedom. So that's what snack activities really open that door to restore the relationship between movement and food. Like we've got it backwards now, you know, like we're trying to, we're trying to exercise off what we eat. Mm. You know, it's, it's reversed. It's like, it's like movement. It's like movement is the atonement for the sin of eating negative and negative, not the other way around where, where how, how grateful am I that my body is allowing me to do this movement to get this other thing that nourishes me? It's mm. all backwards in our mind. We've got it reversed. Oh, Katie, I'm going to have to take some, t I'm going to have to take a nap after this like, just to <laughs> let it. Okay. So, um, you know, in this section, which the chapters here are phenomenal. There's so many different aspects of these containers. But one other thing I'll just highlight really quickly because I, I got I cannot let you go without asking you about something. You brought it up earlier, actually. But one of the other things you talk about in this section is, you know, the 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 movement involved in eating the food itself and how yeah. that's been changed, for example. And now it's just like everything, even if we don't realize it, it's just like so many soft foods. It's just like soft foods forever forever whether you're a baby or not we're still doing this gerber thing smoothie it up and and why this is crazy is just like even we have this idea like for example a potato chip is crunchy just for like one and a half bites and then it turns into mush right eating a crunchy potato chip or a um you know a, a goldfish cracker that dissolves instantly this va uh, vanishing caloric density versus you know Botting down on a, a carrot or an apple or whatever the case might be. These are all mechanical uh, inputs, uh, mechanical nutrients that we're lacking today that are yielding strange developments in how our faces even form, for example. Yeah. So you could call it mastication, but it's this idea, right? Like think about what you think about your biceps and your hips needing movements. Like your jaw is one of the most powerful joints in the body. And it's sitting there doing nothing from, from the time it's born to the time you die. It's just mush for days. And, and it's, it's also this idea of, you know, your body has a lot of stacked functions. So chewing isn't only to masticate food. Your body has put upon your joints many other uh, jobs. For example, chewing also moves blood up to your brain. Mm. What's the consequences of not chewing, um, right? Um, chewing, and then um, I, I put in a section on the mechanics of breastfeeding early on. It's like an early infant jaw workout. And it's not only to get food, it stacks getting food with, you know, I have, I do this thing. It's like, chew something and put your hands on your temples. And if you chew down, you're going to feel that chewing is moving, moving way up high on your skull. It moves lots of parts. It's part of it's the exercise program that lets your jaw know how big to be, mm. you know, how, what shape for your face bones to make. We spend a lot of time dealing with oral motor and dental issues because the suggestion is the mismatch between the workouts our jaws used to get and the workouts that they get now. And so it's just a, it's just another exercise. And, you know, they're, they're finding that kids, they did a study on kids at schools throwing, I know you love food, throwing away whole pieces of fruit that were given to them in the lunch line because they were too hard to eat. Mm. The holding of the apple and the stretch of your mouth and biting it down. So they found that if they sliced the apple, the kids would have no problem eating them. But the, the work of eating the whole apple was really foreign and caused a food waste. It's like, I can't interact with a whole apple. I can only interact with a pre-moved apple. Someone has to move this apple for me. And so we, so like the jaw is such an important piece of human uh, equipment. It's a tool. It was used for more, like this is ancestrally, 
used for more than just chewing the finished food. It was used for making. It was used for, like, we're so used to food being edible, but when you pull food from the bush, it often needs quite a bit of movement to even become edible. And the jaws of many cultures have been used to convert things on the landscape into food by going through this phase. There's a lot of ch- there's a lot of foods that were made by chewing and spitting, um, ripping things off with the teeth, like converting, using it as what we would now use other tools for. And the benefits are, right, You, we all get nice smiles and, you know, there's no broken teeth or things like that. But there is also the trade-off. And there's also going too far, which is we don't chew anything anymore. So get some jerky, get some dehydrated mangoes, put some carrots in there, start your kids young on, on like, I will sometimes just put a whole carrot in a lunchbox. Like it's not clean. It's not nothing. It's like, here you go. If you're hungry, you'll eat it. You know, when they're young enough, they just learn like, this is how you interact with a carrot. It doesn't have to come pureed. It doesn't have to be mushed. You know, once you're able to chew, it can be a jaw workout. Like it's fine. That's what, that's what it's for. Uh, I love this so much. Katie, I've, I want to ask you about everything in the book, <laughs> but I, I want to talk to you about one final topic because we're all doing it right now, which is this clothing container. This is another container, another container that uh, influences our movement significantly. So can you share your insights about the clothing container? And specifically, I really want to talk about the containers that we put our feet into, of course. So talk about the clothing container just briefly, and then specifically the ones that we put our feet in. Well, we get dressed every day. Um, And if we just think about kids, we don't necessarily think about when I get my kid dressed in the morning or they get themselves dressed, can their arms go overhead? Can, do their jeans allow them to bend? Can they lift one leg up off to the side? We just assume that a covering is a covering. These are the clothes that our culture wears, but a sedentary culture breaks clothes up into exercise or movement clothes, Mm. and then the rest of the wardrobe. We don't call those non-movement clothes. We don't call those sedentary clothes. Those are just clothes. And then when we want to step outside and move, we put on our movement clothes. But many kids every day are dressed in clothes that actually prevent them from doing a movement that they are otherwise capable of doing. And and shoes are a big one, especially for little kids. Kids are often put in these big clunky boots, especially rain boots, you know, that here's their little tiny foot and they're and like kids are such emerging computers monitoring their environment, learning how to balance. They're already struggling how to walk. And then sometimes they're wearing these boots that pass over their ankle and go up to their knees. And they're trying to figure out how to control the subtle, the subtlety of their body. And they've got these weights on their legs that make it so the first joint doesn't even work. And so they start lurching around and we're just like, that's how kids move. It's like, no, oh, that's how, mm. <laughs> you know, like we, we really have this understanding. Like if these are the shoes our culture wears and yes, this is what early movers look like. But if you remove the shoes, they don't necessarily move like that. We're, we're not really as keen on seeing our influence sort of in how kids are moving around. And then for grownups too, it's the same thing. You've got 33 joints in each foot. Take your hands, spread your fingers, wiggle your fingers. Imagine playing something on the piano. Like your feet do that too. But we don't, we don't bind our hand. We don't put mittens on our toddlers. Like imagine all these little, if you've ever had kids, you know, you've watched them learn how to grasp a knob, pick up a, pick up anything. It's like a tiny robot. You know, they're curling their little finger. Now imagine putting a mitten on that kid. What, how would they explore the world? And if everyone had mittens on their hands, you would just say, that's how kids move. That's how kids explore the world. So it's just that same phenomenon of we're really, into, we, we put walls around a lot of things as humans right now. You got foot houses and you got, you know, you got waistband houses and you got an upper body house. Like we just, we put ourselves in lots of things for whatever reason. And there are things that we could choose that would allow for a lot more movement for, for us and our kids. Mm, that's so good. So I'm thinking about, 
obviously the um, functionality. So that's a big a big word that a lot of folks are you know part of our lexicon today is the functionality of what we wear. And so, for example, you know, jeans are a big part of the culture, Le becoming less in a sense because it's mm -hmm. been a shift over to tights. Uh, but even jeans have now become much more uh, pliable and movable. Like you could squat down and move around in your jeans pretty well. And I remember I was just talking with uh, a, a guest on the show not too long ago, uh, Emily Fletcher, and she mentioned how jeans used to be. And she referred to them as wearable pain. And I was like, that's so <laughs> yes. good. That's yes. so good. Until you, quote, break them in, right? And that's right. the same thing with the shoes. Like, oh, you mm -hmm. just got to break them in. These shoes are incredibly uncomfortable when you put them on. You got to break them in. But in reality, you know, there's so much, uh, there's so many mechanical nutrients that are missing because of the types of containers that we put on our feet. So can you talk about uh, just a little bit about some of the things for us to be mindful of, like, for example, with the heel of the shoe. Uh, let's start there. Well, the character, you can look at a shoe in terms of the way it affects movement by heel height, right? So, and even a, a trainer or a sports shoe, I'm not talking about heels, high heels. I'm just talking about how much the heel of the shoe is elevated over the toe. So that's one. Another one is the narrowness of the toe box. Mm -hmm. So the part where your toes are in, you know, if you, spread your toes away from each other when they're out of the shoe and you trace that on a piece of paper, set your shoe over it and see if the front of your shoe is more narrow than your foot would need to be if it was really dealing with balance or stretching out on the ground. So we tend to rein, rein the front part of our foot in often. Um, another one is upper. So uh, if you're in California, there's a lot of flip-flop action going on. So an upper is the part of the shoe that connects your foot to the bottom. So, you know, if you put your foot all the way in a shoe and lace it up, that's a full upper. But when you start getting into a flip-flop, that's a partial upper. And what makes it partial is not how thin the straps are. It's the fact that they don't go around the back of your foot. Right. So your foot's always almost sliding out a little bit. So you've got to do, you have to change your gait yeah. in order to keep those shoes on. Maybe you'll grip your toes a little bit. Same thing for uh, any shoe that slides on, really, even if it's a full, you know, clog or slide on. You get, you got to do something to keep it from flying off with every single step. And then the fourth one is the flexibility of the sole. So if you grab your shoe, hold the heel in one hand and the toe of it in the other, and you twist in opposing directions, you're going to see how flexible the sole is on that as a transverse axis. And then you could bend the front towards the back and you see how well it folds. And that gives you a sense of how much feeling of shape beneath my foot is making it up into the muscles and bones and neurology of my leg. Or is my sole so stiff, I'm not really getting the message of the shape beneath my feet. And, and because shape beneath your feet informs your brain quite a bit. You know, it's, 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 it's the tactile. It's letting you know how to adjust the rest of your body. So we've kind of made a repetitive environment for our shoes. It's like, oh, there it is again. Same flat and level, same flat and level, same, 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 same. Like every day, it's just the same, same carpet. You know, it's like, I got these, um, these, uh, my feet in like comfortable sock bags and like, it's just a neutral repetitive environment. So you know, you mix up your shoes, you allow more of nature to get into your feet. Again, stimulate, lights lights up your brain. It, it uses different muscles to do that. Uh, the new wind beneath my wings for everybody is <laughs> going to be the shape beneath my feet. All right. You are the shape beneath. All right. So I love this so much. This is so, so good, so insightful, so powerful. And I love you make this statement in the book because I know as soon as the word, the word heel came up. I know some people were like, I'm not, not my heels. Right. And you say this very explicitly in the book. You say that it's not what you wear. So, so I think, okay, I'm just going to directly quote you. So what you say in the book is that it's what you wear most of the time that matters, right? This doesn't sure. mean that you can't have your fun time. You can't wear your Jordans, your, 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 your high heels, your stilettos, all those things. It's all good but it's what you do most of the time. And I thought about this, the shoes that I wear most often are ones, I, and you have a picture in the book of some kind of curled up shoes, some balled up shoes. 
and those are what I wear most often. You know, it's like some older free runs when they were really pliable, like I can roll it into a ball. And those are the shoes that I wear most often. Whereas, you know, from time to time, of course, if I've got this going on, I put on different shoes and, and I can notice the difference. Sure. That's the thing. And I think it's for us to tune back into that, that mechanical feedback that our bodies are giving us when we're wearing shoes that are a little bit abnormal or a lot abnormal. Noticing the difference is a gift. It, that like th that's the whole point. The point like we all we're all a culture, like I said, but we all have individual cultures, like where no other culture matches up. Like my like you don't share the culture of anyone else exactly. You are unique in that way. You've got you have your apparel in the sense of apparel is also self-expression. So it's not trying to mess with self-expression or even you might actually feel better in certain ways, but it's that in many cases we are imparting um, a lack of contrast. You know, like you can't even feel what a, you, you don't know enough to know if you don't like the way your feet move when you're walking, if you've never felt them before. So it's just making sure that you're providing the full experience so that then as we go on to grow up, we select how we want to move forward versus having no awareness of something of movement. In this case, I'm saying there's a lot of movement to be aware of. You can certainly choose your movement flow going over, but I want to make sure that you're making as much of an informed choice as I can give you. So what you, what you wear now and then even every day briefly is not the same as what you're doing all of the time. So it's like, you know, you don't tell people not to have dessert ever, no, it's, it's the same thing. It's a balance. It's just understanding like I, I'm i going to look at how this affects my body over time. I'm going to experiment with myself. And, and it turns out I actually do I prefer the way this looks and feels when I'm wearing it in these situations. And I'm going to adjust the rest of the time with this choice. And that's what we're all after is just as much information as possible. Absolutely. The new book available everywhere right now is Grow Wild. And we're just scratching the surface We've only talked about the culture container, the clothing container, the cooking container, just little bits of it. And we didn't even get into the home container, the learning container, the activities container, the celebration container. So much good stuff in here. It is a absolutely beautiful book. The photos in here, if you could share a little bit about where the photos are coming from. And then also, please let everybody know where they can put, pick up the book right now. So no stock images. All of those photos were just submitted from families doing it in different places and different situations so that you could see sort of the range, you know, of how people are getting it done because you have to fine tune it to your life. So it's beautiful. I mean, I really love people submitted stories. Um, so they're all real, nothing posed in there, just life in action. And you can get it at uh, growwildbook.com. Perfect. Or Amazon or Amazon or bookstore or wherever you go. All all the usual places. Yeah. You can pick it up anywhere books are sold. Or go to growwildbook.com and pick it up like yesterday. It's so good. I think that everybody needs to have this book. And it's a great book just to have laying around and also for kids to just dig through. I think they'll do some modeling just looking at the pictures in here. I, I wrote it. I mean I wrote I said I we're high, we're highly visual at this point because of social media, I think. Um so I'm like, I'm going to put photos in here that even if the grown up in the house didn't read it, when kids go through it, they're going to be like, oh, yeah. movement's a thing. And so um, we've, I've seen kids pick it up and pour over it. And they're so excited as they go through. So it's like a feel, it's a field guide to movement that you will use for years. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to up level your health today. At the end of the study, they found that when individuals were well rested, they burned 55% more body fat just by getting more sleep. And so the question is, how does this happen? 